everybody. We'll get started. Uh, welcome to the panel, What Makes Fantasy Epic? We have a fantastic group of panelists here to talk about sort of the definition of uh, epic fantasy, how it's evolved, and how they create their worlds. Uh, I am Ellen, your moderator, and I would love the panel to... Stephen, would you like to start with uh, introductions? Okay. Um, my name is Stephen Erickson. Um, I'm the author of uh, The Malazan Book of the Fallen, uh, a ten-volume um, a three million word plus short story. <laughs> Since I don't know how to write, fa I don't know how to write novels. Um, and my my latest book is uh, a Star Trek uh, spoof uh, with love uh, called Willful Child, which uh, basically offends everyone. So, I'm very pleased. I'm very pleased with that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Peter B. Brett. I'm the author of the Demon Cycle series from Delray Books, uh, The Warded Man, The Desert Spear, The Daylight War, and starting on Tuesday, The Skull Throne. Um, but if, since we're here at Emerald City Comic Con, we have special permission to sell it early at the University Bookstore booth, so if you're interested in getting it a couple of days early, uh, you can do that. Uh, my name is Neil Gaiman. <laughs> <laughs> I, I write movies and I'm really fabulous. <laughs> I'm, I'm, my name's Pat Rothfuss. I write big, fat fantasy books. I thought I was going to have to play oh. <laughs> Actually, I'm Neil Gaiman. <laughs> my name is Robin Hobb. I'm probably best known for the Farseer trilogy. Uh, current work is... Um, the Fits in the Fool trilogy, I'm, I'm hammering out uh, book two, which is called The Fool's Quest. I'm Pat Roth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name my name is Peter Arulian. I write a, an epic fantasy series from Tor Books entitled The Vault of Heaven. Um, like like Peter Brett, the other Peter B, because my middle name is Vance. Um, uh, there's a special presale on the first on the first yes yes vengeance we do vengeance something like that. Um, there's a special presale of the first book, which releases on April 7th at the University Bookstore. The con gets it early, so if you want to presale, and then book two hits in May, so you can go kind of bang bang if you get interested. I'm really glad you're not going by Peter V. Arulian, because then, like, we'd have to fight. <laughs> <laughs> we could do that anyway. <laughs> so, um, we're going to go through some dis discussion topics with the panel, and then we will have questions uh, towards the end. There's a microphone in the center, so in the last 15 minutes or so, just please stand up there. Um, let me ask, because it has been a problem in previous panels, please turn off your cell phones. We love your ringtones, just maybe not right now. So to, uh, to open up the discussion, so in terms of, so epic fantasy, defining kind of what it is, would you say there's specific styles, characters, or plots that help make it epic? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Robin, would you like to? Uh, I, I think that um, epic fantasy, in a sense, is uh, a story of something that is world-changing, but the author determines the size of that world. You know, I think epic fantasy becomes, it, it, it's, I think it's mostly an issue of, like, I don't know art, but I know what I like. I think people point at things and say, that's epic fantasy, but everybody does it for a different reason. Um, ultimately, I think it's, it comes, and this is, sounds like a silly uh, defining characteristic, but I think it is just ultimately bigness. Sometimes you can get away with it for bigness of book, you know, uh, for Tolkien, I think he was like, he's epic fantasy, but that's bigness of story and bigness of world. Um, my, uh, my books are big, but I actually don't think I belong in epic fantasy. I think I'm heroic fantasy. Um, unless you want to say my books are big in terms of the scope of a character, you know, but that's, I mean, that's kind of stretching a definition in my opinion. Yeah, I feel pretty much the same way. It's these things that we use to cr try and cram a work into like a, a genre so you can place it properly in the bookstore or help sell it to uh, readers or to booksellers or things like that are thing are they're useful tools at times. But I don't know any author that really feels bound by the rules of epic fantasy or, or I'm writing grimdark so I have to do X or I'm writing dark fantasy so I have to do Y or I'm writing urban fantasy, so I can't do, and, and 
no author that I know actually thinks about those things. And so these uh, genres and these, these appellations that get tacked onto your work after are something that's done by the sales force and doesn't really influence the work as far as I know. So, uh, you know, epic fantasy has been defined to me as sort of broad in scope and, and having a big world that people go on journeys and travel through and you get to see a lot of that and like, I don't know if I really fall in that genre or not. And some people call my work grimdark and I don't really think that it's grimdark, but some people feel that way. And, and I just don't tend to think about it when I'm working on a book. I just write my big fat fantasy books and hope people like them. So. Yeah, I will say the only genre or the, the category that I've ever really liked because it's self-defining is, is BFF. It's like big fat fantasy. And you, like, you look on the shelf and you're like, oh, I know exactly what this is. It's a big fat fantasy novel. Um, is that like a thing or did I just make that up? Oh, no, no. no it's, it, I, I thought of it and I, I think uh, Tad Williams actually yeah, he did. was the progenitor. He was the very first with uh, the, the Green Angel Tower books. Uh, he blazed that trail. George, and you can look at George Martin, Big Fat Fantasy? Yeah, Big Fat Fantasy. Um, and it can be one book or a series, um, but that's the only one that I think has very clear defining things, and you know you're never gonna be disappointed. It's like, well, I thought it was big and fat, but. <laughs> it, I, it's really interesting what, I, what the other Peter said. Which is when he starts. <laughs> when he started talking about um, some of your readers uh, attached to things in your work that is more grim. They think is more grim. Um, others, people I know who read your work, actually call it epic fantasy. So there's maybe an interesting conversation to have around the degree to which what people attach to in the work helps define for them what it is, which frustrates the hell out of marketing people because they don't know then how to market those books to you. And I think that's the other the point. And I work in marketing, so it's a frustration to me too. Uh, but when Sorry. You're, <laughs> I don't market books, I'm, I market video games, but it's still the same issue. You're trying to find something that people will like. Um, uh, but I, I think that, I don't know if we want to explore that, but it's interesting to me to think about um, the, the reader response sort of defining the category versus you know, them finding it on the shelf in a certain place. Well, um, I'll sort of come at this from another angle. Um, epic fantasy is the origins of literature. And it is, if you think of literature as, as a tree, basically, it is the trunk of the tree. And everything else is just sort of branched out from that. And uh, modern uh, contemporary fiction are the twigs at the far end of, of one particular branch. And I, I, I'm always sort of surprised at the extent to which mm -hmm. epic fantasy um, doesn't get sort of the, the, the critical um, acknowledgement that it gets as, as something that we can find back in the Iliad or, or Gilgamesh and all the rest. So I just thought I'd throw that out. But yeah, we can talk about the grim dark. I've been doing that all week, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I also think uh, there's a, like a, a weird inverted hierarchy because most, most of the time things are classed not according to their substance, but their props. Like, you know, let's say, you know, I, I'm writing my current books as soon, like, and in, I, I write a little, but in the third book, I put in a spaceship. Now, it does not matter what else is in those books. If you have a spaceship in your book, you're writing sci-fi. That prop trumps everything else in terms of genre classification. And marketing will take you. Right. <laughs> yes. Perhaps what's behind the stone door. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, really, if you, Spoiler alert. If, you, <laughs> if you think about it, you know, like, Stranger in a Strange Land, what is it? Well, it's sci-fi because there's a Martian. And it can't be anything else, even though, like, nowadays, if it came out, it really should be, like, urban fantasy-ish. Yeah. You know? I mean, Ish. where's the science? Is it, is it, you know, is it science fiction? It's sociological fiction. New genre. Um, if you have a cowboy, you're writing a Western, you know? I mean, it, that's how people really put things in genres, not according to substance, but according to, to scenery. And, and, uh, and you know, uh, I, I always think of like the BBC prop room. You know, if you grab the wrong prop, then suddenly it's like, man, it doesn't matter what you're talking about. If you have a ray gun, it is sci-fi. So what are the props of epic fantasy? 
Swords. Swords? I don't have any swords in my books. Orcs. You, uh, horses. Horses. <laughs> Nobleman. Prophecy. Does, is ma yes, is magic well. required? In your, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to stop using the phrase epic fantasy because big fat fantasy is too perfect. So is, is magic a required element? I, I feel like magic is the defining uh, part of, fa of fantasy. Like That's what makes a fantasy is magic. If, Actually, if it's science, it's science fiction. If it's, it's if awesome. magic, it's fantasy, which is why there's a big argument over whether Star Wars is fantasy or science fiction because the force is kind of magic. Um, but that's a whole other panel. <laughs> I, I, I like this question. Is I don't know if I could agree that fantasy is like the defining character. Magic is the defining characteristic of fantasy. Name a fantasy that does not have magic. You've got a lot of alternate history that borders on being fantasy because of it's, it's taken us to such a very strange place. Of How do we change history? Magic. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I think. I would say it is a sense of the wondrous, and magic is an easy way to achieve that. A, a typical, a very common, almost like ubiquitous way of achieving, achieving the wondrous, but I think it's wondrous is the defining characteristic of what is the fantasy literature. Fair. And, and now that I think about it, I would say that uh, Joe Abercrombie's half a king doesn't have any magic that I can think of in it. But I would still classify it as fantasy, so I've just destroyed my own argument. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he has an element to the wondrous either. Yeah, screw that guy. He's out of the club. Speak <laughs> 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 for Joe. I, I do seem to remember there being uh, being a, just it was a touch of magic. He was it, it was the training that he was undergoing it was rather mystical. That he was going to be trained. I don't want to do a spoiler. Yeah. So I'm just simply yeah, going to say I that. Just, at the end of the book, there are two characters, and one has been instructing. But I'm not, I can't even go that yeah. far. I'm going to yeah. just spoil her. I'll yeah. just say that I'll, I'll back up to what's fantasy. Depending on Joe. Uh, I do. I actually do think that, that magic is a fairly seminal, <coughs> important piece for the description of something that is fantasy. Because, and this is a little bit um, some of the training I had from Terry Brooks. He used to tell me stories about Lester Del Rey. Um, sort of insisting that if magic isn't instrumental to this solving the story problem. Um, now this is like, I'll, I'm going to defeat my own argument here because I recently had some work that was published in, in the universe I'm writing in and I didn't use um, magic at all. And um, I think it's some of the strongest work, strongest work. And so maybe, maybe I'm going to agree with Pat. <laughs> Damn, Pat's always right. <laughs> um, well, and actually, I'm going to, like, I don't know if either of the two novellas that I, I published last year, I mean, if they actually, I mean, you could make a strong case for neither of them having magic in them. So does that mean that they're out of the fantasy club? Is that why I didn't get nominated for you? I, I don't know. I, I, I felt that... Oh, yeah, okay, that may feel I mean, look, I, I, I don't want to be complimenting you or anything, but I read Slow Grow for Silent Things, and, like, about halfway through it, I was like, this whole thing is about magic. <laughs> She's a namer. This is like, all, you know, and like I suddenly like, you're right, there's no palpable evidence of it, and yet at some point, like it just changed the whole way I was looking at the story because I felt like, oh, there's a very subtle magic going on. Like, and you know, I, I, think, I think we might be having ultimately like a semantic discussion here. Like the, uh, the best kind. <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to author talk, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but like, what if, if, if we started saying, well, okay, what's fantasy? Well, it has magic. Well, what do you mean by magic? I bet you if we took magic down to its root, I bet you it would be ultimately uh, that which engages with the numinous or wondrous. Okay, well, uh, how about this as a definition? Fantasy is an extension of imagination. I like that because it makes it a, a really broad umbrella. Yeah. Yeah. We get, yeah. we get yeah. everything. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we can go. <laughs> but then how is that Thank you all for how attending. Is science fiction different? I, I would always, I've always claimed that science fiction is a subset of fantasy. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think fantasy yeah. is the uber umbrella. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I think that's Star Trek. <laughs> Well, how about, how about the hero? So we're, we're arguing that 
magic, maybe, maybe not. But um, would you say there's specific characteristics to the epic fantasy that the hero has to display, or heroine, by extension? I think, um, as a culture, I think we're starting to just use hero as uh, gender neutral, and yeah. I'm, I'm pretty cool with that, if everybody else is. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you, you need a protagonist. I learned that. <laughs> <laughs> trying, to, trying to write a whole book with no main character is tricky. <laughs> Unless you're William Burroughs. Um, uh, the defining characteristics of the, of the of fantastic hero... I know there's, we have tropes and we have traditions, but I think a lot of those are just getting hammered into gravel mm -hmm. and, and to the better of, of the, the genre. Uh, I will give you the defining characteristic of a fantasy hero. Stubborn. Mm. Find one protagonist in any fantasy story that is not stubborn. I'll go, with, I'll go with persistent, yeah. Mm. That's, that's, that's oh, if you want to be nice, nice about it. <laughs> <laughs> Bossy. You know, I also think, and you say that epic fantasy is kind of the, the root and the center of, of everything. I think that we have done a better job of remembering, like, what a, a, a hero is all about. Like, the Greeks figured it out. You need, like, a, an, a, a big person, well, they said, uh, what was it, a great man who falls from a height. You know, mm -hmm. you need a great man, so that's a king. He has a tragic flaw, which is going to be hubris, and then he screws up everything. You know, and that's what a hero is. Um, and a lot of other genres have moved away from that, but fantasy has not. I mean, we, we like superheroes, the whole advent, uh, you know, and that's, that's a, an interesting evolution. You go from hero and these are like really compelling characters. And then you go superhero, and you get Superman, who is not a compelling character. Uh, and I'm sorry if this crushes anyone's spirit. Um, either, and the reason that he's not is that he has lost his flaw. And that makes him boring. He's exciting because he's an adolescent power fantasy, and so when you're like 14 years old, you're like, did you see that? They shot him right in the eye! <laughs> that is yeah, awesome! Okay. But, but that actually, that sort of, I, I was at um, the uh, ICFA conference, um, International Conference on the Fantastic and the Arts, so there's a lot of scholars showing up and, and talking about this. And my argument uh, to a number of people there regarding uh, what's happened to heroes is we have infantilized our heroes mm. uh, to uh, a rather frightening extent. And, and I don't think fantasy as a genre is immune to it, but I don't think it originates out of uh, the fantasy genre. I think it's more likely film, action films, um, where that whole notion of, of the hero is, is almost reduced to uh, sociopathic vengeance. And we're getting, you know, we're getting a lot of that, and it's actually infused a lot of grimdark as well, where uh, you're in a fairly nihilistic universe, that, there's no hope, there's nothing but despair. Um, so I, I have issues regarding the notion of hero. Um, and so I know certainly my stuff, I'm, I'm dismantling it constantly. Well, and you know what, what's really interesting, and I'm kind of dating myself if you want to talk about Smallville. You should date other, other people. <laughs> <laughs> This is the second panel in a row that's used that exact same joke. That was not the other one. But, like, who was really the interesting character as Smallville progressed? It was, yeah. it was Lex. Yeah. Lex. I mean, because Superman was, he, he's static without that internal flaw. You effectively, you move the flaw outside the hero, and that's why you have to have a villain to make so many of those old superhero comics work. Superman's perfect, he needs to be challenged from the outside. Uh, Oedipus Rex does not need an antagonist <laughs> because he's constantly screwing up his own life. Yeah. Um, and, and so you take the flaw out and then you have hero and flaw and who is always the more interesting characters? It's always the villain. And this actually goes all the way back to, I'd argue, like the medieval uh, church dramas. Like, who did you want to act? The expression, don't out Herod Herod. Mm. Um, from Shakespeare, it wasn't Shakespeare, right? 
It, it says... <laughs> it appears a long time ago. <laughs> well, You're really it, dating yourself. <laughs> But what it was is everyone knew if you were going to perform in one of these church dramas, the juicy part was Herod. Because he's, he's like, and you would come out and you would roar and you were a monster and it was like, oh, we're going to kill all the infants. And like, that's what everyone wanted to play because that was the interesting character. All of the other good people, they kind of had to behave themselves and they're very churchy and they're very pure and Herod had all the fun. Um, and he was the one that people showed up to watch. So that, that, goes, that goes back a long way. Do you, do you think, because so, Stephen, we've talked about the, the Campbellian hero. Mm -hmm. Do you think part of this, the, the villain is far more interesting, which I believe is 100% true in superhero movies, is because um, writers are moving away from the, the flawed hero or the, the Campbellian uh, reluctant hero's journey? I don't think writers are moving away from the flawed hero. I, I would, Peter's heroes are flawed. <laughs> I'm all about the flawed hero. Yeah, yeah. And I, I even take it to having the villain, you know, like I, I tend to swap places from book to book where one book you have a villain and a hero and in the next book the villain is the protagonist and you find yourself rooting for them and suddenly see everything from a different perspective, and then it switches back, and you're like, oh right, that was supposed to be the bad guy. And, <laughs> like that, that's what's interesting to me, and, and the idea that uh, the, the sort of cartoonish villain doesn't really exist so much, and it's much more people just having you know legit arguments about land and stuff that they want, and, and uh, demonizing the people on the other side so that they can feel better about the path of violence that, take, that comes to getting what you want, and I yeah, think that... Yeah. I, I mean, villains don't think of themselves as villains. They, just, they have different motivations. And, and pretty much all fantasy heroes or superheroes, one of the traits that seems to connect them all is that they solve their problems with violence. Because it's exciting and fun, and that's, as you say, that's what infantilizes them, because... Nobody wants to see like Batman like you know work out a reasonable solution with the Joker. They want to see him, they want to see him punch the Joker. And, well, like, and who's seen that Saturday morning breakfast cereal cartoon where like you know Superman like is in the alleyway and there's a mugger. He's like help! He punches him, and he's like wait wait it's not my fault. I don't have money to feed my family. And he's like well how do I fix that? He's like well it's it's the local economy, like there aren't enough jobs. And so he busts into the labor bureau and he's like, yeah. And he's like, no, no, it's not us. It's actually, you know, the, the government policies, our whole economy, we're in a depression now. And so he breaks into the White House and they're like, no, actually it's, it's you know, the shadow government. It's how the Federal Reserve is run and all of our fiat currency. And Superman's like, who do I, who do I punch? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now, in terms of, of, of villains, um, you know, I, I've got to talk about Terry Pratchett because, in my opinion, something that one of the many things that he did better than anyone else is you read a book and there are some characters on the edges of the story. Like early on, the trolls are like our thugs and brutes and dumb. And then in a couple of books, you get to know the trolls, and you realize that actually, no, they aren't just thugs and grunts and, and violent nonsense. And then, but it, that happens progressively through the whole book. Everyone who you initially, who initially is viewed culturally as kind of the bad guys, you realize are just guys. And uh, and that never becomes a boring story to me because, and, and in my opinion, I think that's going to be his greatest legacy, is he showed a dozen times that the people that you thought were bad are actually, like, just people. And that's a lesson that the world kind of needs to hear about a dozen times before it starts to soak in sometimes. Um, it's a... It's a very powerful thing in fiction uh, when you see the villain do something compassionate. 
Um, and I mean, when you talk about shades of gray, when you you know the snivy whip whiplashes of the world and the Dudley Do Rights, um, that's it's interesting for a Saturday morning cartoon. Um, but in fiction, m my preference is when I, I get the opportunity to see that side. Uh, and in the main, if the person's doing dastardly things, and then you see them do this, it, it really throws the reader for the loop, uh, for a loop, and I think really deepens the, the fiction itself. Um, I, I don't, how many of you are writers or aspiring writers? I mean, you, maybe you're doing this and, and practicing this. I know I certainly am. But in those moments where you can show the side of the self that is, uh, has an interest outside their own sort of amoral compunctions, I think is, is very, very powerful in broadening the character. Um, and the opposite, I think, is true, right, with the, the Dudley Do-Right character. If you can show them doing something where they make heartbreaking choice that actually has really negative repercussions, um, you know, that, that gives them a complexity, right, making bad decisions, maybe an, an ultimate interest to good. Um, but those are, those are, those are character-building techniques that I think um, more writers are doing now than, than at least what I remember reading when I was young. So, um, in terms of, we're talking sort of more about, you know, the, the, the genre uh, or, or the marketing label, perhaps, in general. Um, I am very curious in terms of, uh, especially as we have so many writers in the audience, specific techniques where you kind of start when you are, you are constructing something that is intended to be an epic story. You draw a map! <laughs> That's is where I started. all fantasies start. Draw yeah. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not BSing. You draw that. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the yeah. bad author maps. <laughs> it's best if it's on graph paper too. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Robin, in, in particular, you've created so many amazing works. Do you have any any suggestions or thoughts where where you begin those? when you're aiming for this kind of, uh, as you were saying, the, the world-changing story? I'm, I'm not sure that people, that I as a writer, set out saying I am going to write all of these books set in this same location. I, I, I really firmly believed at the end of Assassin's Quest, which was my first trilogy, I really firmly believed that I was finished with Hits and it was fine where he was. I got a lot of email from people telling me that that wasn't okay. <laughs> um, but I was ready to move on, and, I, and uh, it was when I, I, uh, I knew that, the, uh, that, I, that I wanted to write another story, which was about the life ships, and that was set in the same world, same sort of magic. Mm -hmm. But I never sat down when I was 40 and said, I am going to write however many books it is now, all set in the same world. It, it unfolds and unfolds and unfolds. And uh, you start to see connections. Um, I think a, lo a lot of our writing happens in your subconscious and suddenly you're in chapter 22 and you think one thing's going to happen, speaking personally to, as, as, as how I write, and suddenly I realize that's not going to happen because of something that happened in chapter six, two books ago. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really a, a game you're playing with your own mind in some ways. And I, I don't know if anybody else writes that way. But, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> it unfolds. Not that I can go back that many books, but <laughs> <laughs> I hope to someday. <laughs> you know, I, in, in terms of where you start, I think we ended up kind of digging a deep groove in the genre because Tolkien had such a, a deep shadow. And at, you know, speaking of market forces, like the, the Lord of the Rings hit, and then suddenly everyone's like, this is great, we want more of this. And when you have a huge market demand like that, then the publishers are like, well, so how can we give them more of this? And then authors said, well, I could write that. <laughs> and then they did, and so you end up, but when you end up with things kind of written for that, it's like it, you're, you're kind of making a copy of it. You're, you're following this to a purpose that is less than, I don't want to say less than artistic, but yeah, kind of less than artistic. <laughs> um, and then what happened is everyone read all of those books that were kind of in Tolkien's shadow, and then those people wrote what they knew, 
which was those books. And so then you get kind of the third generation of Tolkien-esque folks. And as a result, everyone looked at like, what is fantasy? What is epic fantasy? And they go, well, it's a world. You probably have elves and dwarves. And there's a lot of mythology. And you probably have some imaginary languages in it. But, and, and that was true. But that was just what was happening. Whereas if you go back to Tolkien, Tolkien didn't say, OK, what do you need to make a good world? It's that Tolkien was a geek for languages. It's that Tolkien was a geek for mythology. And he was a geek for the Norse Eddas. And so he ripped them off. And, <laughs> and so he took all these things that he was really passionate about. That's what being a geek is. It's being passionate about something kind of beyond reason. And so he took his, his passions and they informed his world. And that's what made his world so rich and cool and, and appealing to us. Um, now, for me, I'm not a linguist. Like, I kind of am interested in economies and currencies. And so, like, nobody ever buys anything in Tolkien's books. But you know, he didn't care about that. Um, but I do. I care about sociology and psychology and history and dead religions. And so, those things have informed my world. And so if you're writing a world, don't say, oh, this person did this, I have to do this. Like, if you dig butterflies and crochet and, and, like, and you're a foodie, do that. Like, I, I would read that. <laughs> you know? And nobody else is going to write that world. Uh, that's just you. And I think that actually, uh, I think you've just destroyed an earlier argument you made. Yes. <laughs> um, you, were talking, you were talking about the, maybe it wasn't your argument, but there's the Superman and he was going into the White House and he wanted to punch something. I actually find it refreshing that there's fantasy being written where there's not always something that needs to be punched. Um, have, how many of you read The Long Prize Quartet by Daniel Abraham? Yeah. You're missing out, folks. Oh, That's yeah, excellent. you need to go read that. Like, um, you know, he, Daniel is fascinated with commerce and the Medicis. And so he, he wrote this book inspired by that, this, this quartet of books inspired by that. Um, even your own books, Pat. I mean, I think, you know, I, I don't remember a large scale war in your books. Um, uh, but there's a, there's a resonance to them that I think is in evidence just, you know, by their success. Well, there's certainly violence, though. And it's, there's and violence. It both certainly solves problems. Sometimes, like, not, not always by kicking ass, but it, but it happens often enough. But I think it's fair, and I don't, not, I don't want to get into a debate, or maybe I do. Um, <laughs> what are we here for? <laughs> um, but yeah, I think you can say with Pat's books in particular, like, I think a lot of people, even though both has a, a lot of um, power, he does so much that's cerebral, right? And it's fascinating to watch him go and, and do, you know, tackle those problems intellectually. Um, and I might be trying to create the genre so that I can write this and succeed. But I, th this idea that um, uh, a, a hero doesn't necessarily need to be the guy who's escalating toward a grand scale and epic fantasy. You know, maybe, maybe he's going to try and avert war. How about that? Well, and one of the things I really liked about Fitz is, and it's, I, I, I don't think I deliberately ripped you off, um, <laughs> but we certainly have a commonality in our characters there where, you know, Fitz occasionally is like, all right, let's fix this. I'm going to set everything on fire. <laughs> and he does, and he's like, there. Because, like, that's how a 16-year-old thinks. <laughs> um, you grow up and you look back at it, and you say, do you have an entirely different view? And you're like, boy, that was not a long-term strategy. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 as using that, I, maybe I'm misremembering because it's been a few years, but I feel like in Assassin's <clears throat> Apprentice, Fitz doesn't actually kill anyone. Almost every time he's assigned to kill someone, he like finds another way to solve the problem so that he doesn't actually have to kill someone. And I like, and maybe I'm misremembering. Stuff happens off the page. Mm. And that, that may be why. But, uh... but he also is not usually making those calls himself. He's, right. like he's assigned to kill someone, but I, re I remember a couple of instances where he like found another way around the problem that was necessitating the assassination so that he could kind of be like, well, you know. Screw that up. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, actually to, to go back to, you know, the, 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 the hero villain mm -hmm. thing again, uh, there's the classic quote, uh, you know, fairy tales exist not to tell us there are dragons, but that dragons can be beaten. Yeah, I'm butchering that, but. Um, 
you know, and what you mentioned, this, this oversimplification, um, you know, that's a really great thing for people to learn. You know, because we live in like a really scary world and it's very easy to feel powerless. And I don't think that's a new thing. That's why these folk tales, they have a person who is at, at a disadvantage, who goes out. In the old folk tales, it was usually through cleverness. Mm -hmm. Although, yeah, sure, you maybe had like some magic boots or whatever, but you use those in a clever way and therefore you overcame this, this seemingly insurmountable force. You, you beat a dragon, you beat an ogre, a giant. But then, unexpected luck of widow sons. Yes, the yes. unexpected luck of widow sons. <laughs> but, 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 here, let me, so what happens is, is this happens, and we're like, yeah, and then it's kind of the equivalent of Superman punching someone and it solves the problem. But that metaphor is so appealing, and then it gets repeated so often, and it's when it stops becoming a metaphor. It's the problem. Does that make any sense to anyone? Yeah, yeah that makes sense. I mean, there, there are, it's almost an over, oversimplification to just look to Tolkien as the, um, the seed to uh, fantasy because you had sword and sorcery uh, running in, yeah. in parallel, even proceeding um, in some respects, especially in terms of making maps. And so, you know, the origin of, uh, with Howard and, and Liber and all the rest, um, they were running a completely different stream that, that came out of pulp fiction, came out of, um, you know, uh, noir for that matter. And so it was your Sam Spade in, in, with swords. And it was a very different kind of approach to, to fantasy. So if, if you're thinking in terms of um, writing uh, um, an epic fantasy series, uh, bear in mind that, that Tolkien is not the only launching point. And, um, Curiously, we got into a big argument uh, last week in, in Orlando at this conference where that was the, the issue was that what was the legacy of Tolkien and um, I almost had books thrown at me when I said that the legacy of Tolkien might be that he's holding back fantasy in terms of criticism. <laughs> but this, oh. see, nobody's throwing anything together. That's but well, hold on, the, the, the other thing I want to mention just in terms of for, for writers, um, if you are going to do a series, you can really screw up with your editors, or rather, you can really screw your editors. Because what you do is you say, you know, in, in book one, you, you create a scene, and, and you know, your, your novel is 350,000 words long, and your editor's sweating, and <laughs> comes over and says, you know, well, can we cut that scene? Well, all you have to say is, no, that comes back in book eight. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do that often enough, they just sort of curl up and die. <laughs> so there, there's a bit of advice for, for all you beginning authors. Yeah, editors love that. <laughs> so we have a few minutes now for questions. If uh, folks would like to come to the microphone. Uh, and just to preface, uh, please make it a question and not a long statement. Uh, question words. Yeah. Who, not, what, where, when, and why. How. Not a story about your cat. <laughs> Even a great but, story. But no about pressure. Your cat. Yeah. So, so I, I don't know if this follows in other medium, but. Uh, when you work in certain environments, you learn the basic rules. Like these are the rules you follow in order in a trade, in order to finish a job, not hurt yourself, and get the thing done. But once you get to a certain level of ability, the person teaching you will say, "Well, those were rules of thumb. You can bend or break them if you're careful about it." So I was kind of curious. There was some vague level of agreement that magic might be required for fantasy, but wouldn't that be an interesting exercise for a writer to take sort of the rules and try to break one or omit one? No, this is no you, you can't ever break any of these rules. <laughs> <laughs> this is what every writer does. I think this is what makes uh, each writer unique, is, is to take those rules that, we, that we're taught and then start, okay, now that I know the rules, how can I muck with them? Um, when I was uh, starting out as a writer, uh, I sent a couple of books to an agent, and he said, look, you have really good stuff here, but you're making a lot of amateur mistakes. You don't know the rules as well as you should. He gave me a book called Writing to Sell, which is basically like, here's, we, we boiled every bestseller ever down into this set of rules, and this is what you need to, to make a successful book. And I read that book, and I didn't agree with a lot of it, but knowing where those rules were made me much more deft in, in breaking them, and I feel like my work was much stronger because of that. When I was trying to break rules when I didn't entirely understand what they were, it was clumsier. 
And so there's something to be said for, for knowing your rules before, you, knowing perspective before you break it. Successful criminals know what the law is. <laughs> they're, they're, they're called lawyers usually. <laughs> I mean, okay, we're in, we're in kind of a postmodern approach to, to fantasy anyway, so everybody sort of understands the tropes, and it, it's all down to uh, knowing the rules before you can break them, as, as a basic sort of writing rule. Um, but I think, I think we are really sort of taking on a subversion of those tropes and, and dismantling them a lot these days, which I think is, is, is just a, it's a good thing. It's fun. I, I will say... Uh, Who's read Naked Lunch or like any William Burroughs? Yeah. Was it a compelling read? Was it a page turner? You know, he was kind of like, just like, how, how much shit can I break? Can I write a story with no scene, character setting, plot, narrative structure, Aristotelian unities? Yes, you can. Well, it Good. works fine once you drop some acid. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, you can break all these rules, but here's, here's my, my rule. You can do whatever you want, so long as it works. And that's, I mean, it's the best rule, and it's the most useless guidance. <laughs> because you can do whatever you want, but does it work? And that's the only deciding factor. And if you're breaking the rule solely for the sake of breaking the rule, I don't think it's going to work. You have mm -hmm. to say, this is my story. This is my story that I love. This story breaks the rule. I'm writing it anyway. Yeah, that, I think, I've read books where, um, it, it's almost like the writer had the checklist of tropes, and, this, and they would check them off as they uh, tried to avoid them, thus creating trope avoidance as the new trope. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, your question, please. All right. Um, to what extent can you make a epic fantasy uh, mundane? Uh, kind of watching the guy that I want to see what the word for mundane is. Uh -huh. um, I think that when you're writing fantasy, you have to have a very solid idea of what the mundane is in your world. If I create a scene in which a horse goes three days without food and water and then charges up a hill into battle, anybody who knows anything about horses is going to say, this is stupid. And you're not going to believe what I tell you about dragons. So if you're writing anything mundane in your world, you need to be as accurate as possible to those mundane things in order to make your fantastic elements believable. Except for travel. You can travel a million miles. Easy. Fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, horses, yeah. Have you read that? Oh, yeah. Totally works. I borrow your horse. <laughs> and they can run like 100 miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> Only shadow facts. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's actually a great example. Shadowfax was the cool. World turned yeah. Beneath his feet. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. like Shadowfax can't be cool if you don't have rules for regular horses. You know? Yeah. That's what and, and Shadowfax is a third of what made Gandalf cool. <laughs> a little bit. So yeah. like staff twenty horse? <laughs> 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 the lower third anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, next question, please. Hi, um, so I'm going to use an example from Robin Hobbs' books to help illustrate my question a little bit. Um, in your live ship series, I uh, see this underlying theme of, and I think Paragon actually says this to Althea, um, you know, when humans are in pain, we have the tendency to pass our pain on to other people because we think we'll lessen it. Um, I thought that that was like a really strong theme that resonated really well with me. So my question is, when you as an author, all of you, you know, um, put those themes into your books, do they happen for you naturally? Do you kind of plan that out? Is there a level there that you're trying to achieve where you're trying to kind of send that underlying message to make, I feel like, fantasy more relevant, I guess I would say. I don't want to make it say more relevant, but have more grounding and resonate more with your audience because, I mean, you do kind of need to do that because you're not writing, you know, your standard world. Does that make sense? If no. You, if, if you're choosing <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, I, I write stories because I have, in many cases, more questions than answers. And so for me, it's a chance to look at something and try to look at it from all different angles and sides and come up with a way to say, how does this possibly make sense? So it's not like I'm trying to give the reader a message. Sometimes I'm just trying to explain the world to myself. Okay. Um, I would say that, that 
when you're writing, there, there's, there's two parts to a story. There's what happens, and then there's how your characters feel about what's happening. And the meat of the story is how your characters feel about what's happening. And so when your characters are suffering because of something that's going on, or when your characters are feeling glorious because of something that's happening, uh, what happened takes a back seat to making the reader feel the way the character is feeling as they go through these experiences. Because that's kind of what we want when we go on an adventure. We want to feel like we're on the adventure. And so I feel like the whole art of writing is making those emotions that are going on in the story resonate with whoever's reading it. And that, I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question or not. But I yeah. thought it was clever. Thank you. <laughs> All right, your question, please. I've, I do a lot of reading in my spare time and instead of doing my homework sometimes, and one of the things I find that has a lot of variety in everything I read is, is names, and how do you personally name things? Like anything but before, like characters and even like plants. I have a big book of na baby names. <laughs> 25,000 baby names, and I just flip through it and like, Change the spelling. <laughs> I just try and find consonants and vowels that sound cool together. Uh, I, I, the obituary page will take you back uh, 60, 70, 80 years to where there are names that at one time were common and have become <coughs> uncommon. The other thing that you can do is, uh, is play around with language. Um, if you have... Uh, if you take a, a Latin-based uh, noun and turn it into somebody's name, people are going to pick up the resonance of, of, of verity, which is a perfectly legitimate rule, but it also means truth. And uh, so you, you, you throw in those resonances of this is a, as a name that sounds almost like, like something you're familiar with. And so you, you flavor that character with the name you give it. And cool. You, you, maybe next Comic Con, you will. I, I would do a panel about naming. I, but I don't have enough time to talk about it. Right now. I think we have. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question. Get the last question. All right. Um, just hoping you guys could talk a little bit about legends and myths used in your own story. Like that's just a common thing in epic fantasies and uh, BFFs, as they're now named. And uh, just what are some Things to stay away from. What are some things you look for? You know, yeah, just open question. Yeah, that, can I get it in the form of a question? Oh, okay. Um, how do you decide when a legend is going to be too obvious for the reader? Like, this is what I'm going to do in the future. He's going to be the one, you know, to lead us to salvation. What do you do to avoid stuff like that? Or you mean in terms of prophecy? Yeah, prophecy, okay. legend, myth, stories, backgrounds, dead legends, stuff like that. Well, there's a difference between a prophecy and a legend. You know, a legend is something that happened a long time ago, and like we've been retelling the story over and over and over again, and maybe we don't have the story right anymore because it's been retold so many times. Whereas a prophecy is something that's predicted that may happen in the future. And sometimes they come full circle, but they're not entirely the same thing. So I avoid it by not doing any bullshit prophecy. <laughs> I, I, it's my least favorite fantasy trope. The whole like, oh, it's the one, he's the one. It's the chosen something. No, 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 no. It's, well, it, yeah, you could do it like sort of the, the Delphic Oracle, where um, the prophecy is so confused that um, nobody can figure it out anyways. Mm. I, I've always viewed it, and, and yeah, I, I've seen that done a lot of times. I always view it as cheap, like, tension. You know, it's like, oh, I want to make this seem really important, but I don't actually want to develop my craft to the point where I can engage the reader. <gasps> I can have a prophecy that says it's important in the first chapter, and then everyone has to believe it. And no, I hate it. But <laughs> hate it. Yeah, I. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not about to argue in favor of prophecy. <laughs> I was going to take it back to legend and say that there's one thing that I do feel is consistent, probably in all of our works, is there was a time gone by, way previous to the time when our heroes are in their setting that is referred back to, like, oh, back in the day when, you know, Kaji, like, fought the demons, or, oh, back in the day when the elderlings were there, or, like, you know, there's, there's a back in the day in almost every major fantasy story I can think of offhand that is referenced a lot because that is a moral guide and a, and a life guide for the characters in the now, and so that 
does seem to be something that, that's inherent in most fantasies. Discuss. You know, actually, <laughs> it, it, you, you brought those up. I think these are almost like the two, the, the two antithetical elements. A prophecy is like, oh, something may, something cloudy might happen in the future, but a legend is something cloudy that happened in the past. I much prefer the slow uncovering or the, the trying to dig down to the, the hidden truth in the roots of the world because there it's a mystery, it's something you're trying to uncover as opposed to trying to unravel something that might happen in the future. I, I just, I, I find it so distasteful. Really? Really? You seem offended by it. I, I really, I, the, more I, the more I think about it, the more I find myself like really morally offended by it. <laughs> there is, um, you know, in your world development, if you're writing a, an epic fantasy, a lot of the work you do to, in world creation is a lot of that stuff that happened in the past that informs the, the, the now, as Peter was saying. Um, and that's really rich stuff. Um, that can influence your economies, your religions, for sure, um, the cultures as they develop. Um, and that, that adds a layer that I think is necessary in, in real good second world development in particular. Um, I'm not a big fan of the, the prophecy either, but I think the, the legend stuff, that sort of yesteryear, that um, you don't do the big data dumps, and I'm sure you've heard that kind of guidance before. But once you've done that work, that can be peppered into your narrative um, to really give it an authenticity that in the absence of which it's just, you know, it will lack, frankly. Well, in, my, in, in the Malazan series, there's a, a kind of a, a tarot deck. Um, but for me, it's primarily an opportunity to further mess with your heads. So, um, and there, there's just, yeah, it's just, it's, it's good fun. It's good fun. Thanks, guys. Well, sadly, we are coming to the end of our time. Um, all of our panelists will be at the writer's block area, which is JJ 10 and 11. If you just sort of go through the celebrity area, you will find everyone there. Thank you all for being a great audience, and please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.